here in the slides today is a little redundant, you've seen it all before, but um, there's some new stuff about how this course is structured, group formation. This course is very different from any other course you're going to take at Mac and any other course you have already taken at Mac. So I strongly recommend you read the six pages of the course outline. There's a lot of detail in that course outline that covers some of the stuff that I've got in the slides today, but there's a bit more in there that I expect you to read through, certainly before the next week or two of the class. So let's take a look at a bit of how this course is structured, what we're going to be looking at, and how this course is operating. So for most of you, this is your final year. You've come back from the summer, either you've had a co-op, or you maybe weren't quite fortunate to have a co-op job, but you've had some other job. Uh, we had some interesting discussions in the tutorial today. There were some interesting groups. And then yesterday I got to, a chance to talk within those uh, groups that we did in the tutorial um, and get to meet a few of you. And one thing that was really interesting for me when I went through that process with you guys is how many of you really wanted a co-op but couldn't find it? So the job market is a little bit tough out there, but we're going to be learning some skills in this course that are not engineering skills, but softer skills that will help you market yourself in job interviews. So even like that group speed dating that we did today in the tutorial and yesterday in the tutorial, some of you missed out on that, it's unfortunate. But for those of you that were there, you got a good opportunity to see how just to even engage someone in small talk. That's a good skill that you need to have. And right off the bat, your first question in a job interview is a little bit of small talk. Right? How do you sort of start that conversation and keep it going? So you got a chance to do that yesterday. This course will be filled with these softer skills, not just engineering skills. So I don't take full credit for this course material. In fact, it would be really tough to design this course from scratch by myself. We're building up on a wealth of material. Don Woods, who passed away last year, um, but he was, a, he was in the department as a professor since the 1960s. And then Tom Marlin, who also retired two, three years ago, but will probably come back to this course and give a guest lecture or more. Um, he's very actively involved still in the university. Well, um, these two guys really built up this course to what it is. So we'll use Dr. Marlin's notes and textbooks extensively. Um, Dr. Marlin has written a whole other textbook, not just the process control one, but another one that really covers a lot of the topics we need to be looking at. And Don Woods, whose notes uh, really kick-started this course and then was refined by Tom, um, we're going to be using those as well. The course is obviously taught by myself totally, but there will be a few guest lectures, as I said, by Tom and, and other people that I'm going to try and get in. Most of you know me, though. Um, I'm originally from South Africa, graduated here from Mac in 2002 with a master's degree. Uh, I don't have a PhD, so just call me by my name, please. I'm not doctor. I am full-time now at university since 2012. This is going on to my third year. And I'm more than happy to meet with you at any time that I'm available. To do that, please send me an email with the topic that you'd like to talk about. This is no different, and you'll see this coming through this outline, to the relationship you would have with your manager at work. Um, you're probably unlikely to just walk into your manager's office and just interrupt him or her in their daily work. It will usually be an appointment that you set in a calendar or by email that you've arranged ahead of time with a specific topic that you'd like to talk about. And so we'll do the same thing in this course and I expect you to follow that procedure. Please, because it just helps me manage my time and it makes our meeting more effective as well. If I know what you're coming with ahead of time, I can prepare for that. We can both have a quick meeting to resolve the issue. The teaching assistants for this course, we have three of them. Um, there's 100 plus students in this class. We have three TAs. Uh, up here at the front is Hero, and at the back there is Tyler. Hey. Um, some of you got to meet Tyler yesterday, some of you got to meet Hero yesterday. And Mirto is on uh, the way back to Canada. Um, she's finishing up her PhD with Dr. Sheardown. 
Uh, Tyler's doing his master's with Prashant, and here is just starting his master's with Dr. Prashant. Okay, so you can meet them at those, those their offices, um, but the way to meet up with the TAs is also through email. Now the TAs, because there's so many of them, and we want to keep things centralized, is we have a single email address for the TAs. So if you printed out the notes earlier, you may have their individual emails. Please don't use those. We've agreed on with the TAs that they will be checking that email account regularly. You'll be seeing that email account later on as well with Google Docs. We'll be sharing the document with the TAs that way. But that email address is the way to contact the TAs, and then they will, the best person to meet with you and the most available will make sure that they get a chance to catch you. So the same, same principle, arrange a meeting with the TA and they will follow up with you. We don't have office hours, as I've mentioned in the prior 4M class. Office hours are generally ineffective because either no one shows up and that wastes an entire hour of the TA's time. Um, because it's hard to schedule office hours when everyone here who's in the class, somewhere in the fourth, fifth, sixth year, um, everyone's got very different course schedules, so we cannot possibly find an hour that works for So that relationship that the TAs and myself have with you is very much one of colleagues and managers. It's very collegial and would be exactly the relationship you would see when you start working next year. So it's a very different relationship to your first year, second year, third year instructor-student relationship. I'll get to know most of you by first name, hopefully within the next few weeks, and we will keep that collegial relationship going throughout the semester. So that pro propagates not only in the class time, but also through emails and being professional about meetings. So meetings with an agenda and then follow-ups with minutes afterwards. And there will be graded group meetings throughout this course where you get a chance to do that. So when you do email the TAs or myself, please indicate your group number. Everything is group based in this course. You'll be allocated groups that are of the type A123, B123, 45. So let us know which group you're from so that we can adjust things that way. And also please email from your MacMaster address. You wouldn't email your boss from your Hotmail or Gmail account. Nor would you email your clients or colleagues from your personal email. So we'd like you to use your MacMaster address. And for me personally, I have all my Mac email filtered in various folders. And if it comes from a non-Mac address, it gets very low priority. Okay, so my, at MacMaster, email gets um, high priority in my inbox. And so I'll take care of it right away. I do also record these classes. There's a video camera at the back that's recording. And there's audio recordings. Now, the quality may not be the best as people come and go. That microphone at the back is going to pick up that noise. Uh, the visual quality may not be the best. And the contrast between the blackboard and the whiteboard might not always be clear. You may not see all the details when we start drawing P and ID diagrams. And there's lots of lines going. The visual quality, obviously, if you're sitting here in the class, is a whole lot better because our human eyesight has a resolution far better than any digital camera can provide. So we need to use that only as a backup. And I recognize that this time of the year, many of you are going for job interviews, co-op interviews. You're away for whatever reason from class. So that video is a chance for you to simply catch up on the part of the class you missed. Or maybe you just need to replay a five, 10 minute period where there was a pretty intense derivation going on. You didn't get a chance to raise your hand and ask a question. You didn't quite understand the concept. You might just need to go watch it a second or a third time. So that's the purpose of those, those audio and video recordings. Um, they'll be posted to the course website within a day or so after, after class. Not always the fastest, but I try to get them up pretty soon. Any questions on that so far? I'm going to leave, right? You're free to. Okay. <laughs> Textbooks and references and readings. Now, there isn't a textbook that covers this course material. 
Um, we will use Dr. Marlin's notes extensively, and chapters from the book that he's currently working on, he's kindly allowed us to post and use as reference material. So those will be posted on the course website, as well as many other references to, to topics that I feel will be good background information and fill in your knowledge. There are two textbooks though. The first one you've likely used for 3G and hopefully still have, um, the Cedar Cedar book. The second book, the yellow one by Turton and, and a whole variety of other people, is available in the fourth edition, though the third edition is, is equally good. And that contains pretty much the same material as the Cedar textbook. And either option would be a good one to have. If you have them, that's great. They're not required, but they are recommended. Now, this course may not be in the right place for you to be right now. It is a core course, so you will have to go through 4N at some point in your career. There are a few people enrolled in 4N right now who this is not their final year. And I don't want to particularly alter your plan, but I would strongly suggest that if this is not your final year at Mac, that you consider taking this course next year. It works really well with 4W and then you finish up your degree. And the reason is, statistically, students who are a little further on in their program do far better in this course because they've got a time where their third year and second year material and perhaps a co-op term or two has really sunk in and they see the immediate need for why this course material is relevant. Okay, so if you're not yet about to graduate, and your schedule allows it, feel free to take this course up next year. I'll still be teaching it. Um, and so that's just something to consider for the five or 10 of you in the class that this is not your final year. Okay, everything related to this course is always on our website. So the 4 and 4 website is up there in purple. I expect you to check it every day, pretty much to make sure that you're up to date with the announcements. If you go look at the announcements archive from previous <coughs> years, um, so for example, you can always get to see previous announcements by clicking on that link over there. Uh, if you go look at the 2012 archive or the 2013 archive, there's an announcement pretty much every day of the week. Something that's new that's posted, a reference, a reading, an update to the assignment, um, some new course notes, whatever the case might be, um, is posted over there. If you're going to forget to check, you may feel free to subscribe to the Twitter feed for this course. Every announcement that's made is also tweeted, and so you can get that announcement pushed to you that way. And you can also engage with the 4 and 4 CHE handle there to interact with the instructor, I, okay? I will be, I check that all the time. The website is the central location for everything. I will not email you. I'm unlikely to ever use your email address to communicate to the entire class. There always will be just announcements posted to the site, so I assume that you check that out. Okay, so one final thing is the course feedback mechanism. You're welcome to face to face. Um, let me know how things are going or not going so well, or use this feedback form to let me know of any changes or consideration of something that I might not be aware of that's going on let me know how I can improve things for you. Okay, before I get into this slide, are there any administrative questions that are in the back of your mind? Okay, now this slide might be a little bit new to you. If you're not aware of the structure of this course and the courses you've taken at Mac, this might be a good time to see where we've led you so far. It's very intentional that our program and our curriculum at Mac has a lot of thoughtful design going into it. And we keep updating it every year. And this is pretty much where it is, except the only glitch in this is that 3.0 is now, now 2.0 and is the second year fluid mechanics course that most of you have taken. But some of you did take it when it was 3.0. By and large, that structure is still there. And what we have is we have several streams through the department. We have your science and math courses going on in second year. Those would be your chemistry courses and the math 2Z courses. We also have what we call our basic chem -eng or analysis course, 2D and 2M. First, year, first term and 
second term courses that you took over there. And then we have what are core, our core ChemEng science courses. We call them engineering science for accreditation purposes, but those are our core chemical engineering courses. That's where you've got all the, the strong theory and the background. So you started off there with heat transfer, the 3A, 2A course, the 3O, um, or no, oh, sorry, 3O and now called 2O fluid mechanics, 3M separations, 3D thermo, 3K reacts design, 3P process control. So that's the core fundamental chemical engineering stream. And you had your labs that, that linked up with those science courses. So everything you saw in the labs, you saw in your science course, and mostly in sequence, sometimes a little bit out of sequence. But by and large, you try to line those up that way. And you get to take a whole bunch of interesting tech electives in your third year and final. We also then have what we're, where we are at now here at 4M, but you've taken two prior courses in one of the design sequence. So Kim Jones and Emily taught 2G, and then Dr. Adams taught 3G. I'm teaching 4M, and then next term you'll be taking 4 double in various streams. That's our design sequence, and they build up on that. So you've learned some good communication skills in 2G, problem solving skills in 2G. In 3G, you learned Trouble, uh, not troubleshooting, you learn some flow sheeting and synthesis and design of flow sheets, a bit of engineering economics, sustainability along the way, and we're going to build on that in 4A by looking at some topics that I'll show you. Here. And then you're going to bring all of those together next term and apply all of that in a single design project that you'll be doing with the next Okay, so very careful thought that's gone on to this, and you're almost at the end of the road here in terms of your undergraduate studies. So there's uh, a bit of the design sequence in more detail. There's the 3G course, flow sheeting, synthesis, physical properties that you've learned about with Aspen and Isis. 4N, we'll be looking at economics and operability. I'll go into that detail in a second. And then 4W, next term, you'll be looking at, at sort of like a capstone of bringing all of this together. So if you don't have these slides right now, they are on the website. Feel free to print them and bring them to, um, to class in the future, or print them after the fact to, to get. But I'll always post these slides ahead of time. And I know with the first week, people don't always have the chance to get them. So what's in this course? Well, in this course, you're going to take a look at flow sheets and really see them in a very different light. You've seen basic flow sheets already in your second year and third year courses, but we're going to go into far more detail related to those flow sheets. We're going to be looking at safety on the process, alarms, interlocks, process control. Process control plays a fundamental part in this course. Okay, that knowledge of 3P is really critical to succeeding here at 4N. So understanding the time-dependent behavior in the process. We'll be looking at this topic that's got a very broad title of operability. There's many subtopics under operability. In fact, they're listed over here. We can go back and look at them. Operability includes understanding what is flexibility in a chemical process. Why do we have that flow sheet designed with multiple pumps and heat exchangers? What, flex what does flexibility mean? And what why is it useful for us? We'll be looking at safety and profitability dynamics and control, and then we're ending off the course with some troubleshooting, um, which is really, really important. And probably is one of the skills that, when you're working as an engineer next year, you're going to be doing, more than anything else, you'll probably be doing troubleshooting most of the time. Okay, so it's kind of interesting that you do all this work in engineering, and you might think you're going off and going to be designing heat exchanges all day, process control loops, but a lot of you, your time will be spent on troubleshooting and, and fixing problems in the process. How many of you have done a co-op term? What did, was that true in your co-op term? Troubleshooting and fixing problems? Pretty much. Were you allowed to go design a heat exchanger and it was implemented on the process? <laughs> Probably not just yet, but that might happen in a few years from now. You get a chance to upgrade a, a small piece of the process or a larger piece of the process. But by and large, most of the things that engineers do is troubleshooting. And even though we cover it in a very small way in this class, it brings together everything from your prior courses. And we'll, we'll show how that works near the end. OK, so there is um, this course 
in the four major topics we'll be looking at. And I will add this over here. There is no other course to my knowledge in Canada that does this. Uh, I've looked at the other curriculums from other departments. There is no other similar course that ties in these topics in the unique combination that we have here at MAC. Okay, so we'll start off over here by looking at the economics. So I've shown a reactor here in the middle, and we've all done reactor design. But now we're going to really start looking at the economics of that reactor. What, if, what about its profitability? How much does it cost to build? How much does it cost to operate? How many operators do we need to, to run it? How does that play into our economics and profitability of the process? We'll be looking at operability then just after that. And that's going to look at how can we move that reactor in terms of its operating window. High temperatures, low temperatures, high pressures, low pressures. What combination of settings works and how does that affect the process? Safety then plays into operability because we can't move the process to unsafe regions of operation. So we'll be looking at how do we as engineers safeguard our process. We don't want that reactor being damaged. We don't want to damage our equipment, but we also don't want to damage the people in the plant and injure them. And bear in mind that that plant doesn't exist in isolation. It's in a community. There's neighbors and there's people living around your facility. So their health and safety is also important. So what do we do as engineers to ensure that safety? There's multiple layers that we, that we implement to make sure that that process remains safe. And then finally, things don't always work as they should. So troubleshooting and how we do we systematically go about troubleshooting. So think about it this way. If you've given a, a presentation, almost certainly you've faced the problem where your PowerPoint slides don't project up onto the screen. So you go in, you plug your laptop in, and it's like, oh shit, this thing doesn't work. Right? So how do you troubleshoot that? Right? There's, instead of going into a big panic, and worry, is there a systematic process we can follow to try and fix up the system? Okay, and that's what troubleshooting is. It's not just worrying about the process, but let's think about this systematically and apply our knowledge of the process to fix the problem. Okay, so we're going to bring those four topics in, and then there's a fifth one that comes in a little bit that can't really be shown here, and that's engineering ethics. We'll touch a bit on ethics and understanding. And you've seen that in a variety of other courses so far. Okay, so sleepy Friday afternoon, a lot of people's eyes are drooping off. <laughs> Any questions so far? Okay, let's take a look at a few other details in the course. So there's, there's a lot of professional skills you'll be learning about. Uh, one of the main things that I'm going to try and have you figure out by the end is that you're responsible for your own learning. I was working at Glaxo and on the 23rd of December, the last day before the company closed for Christmas, the guy across the corridor from me was in his 50s and got laid off. Okay, so just the day before Christmas, two days before Christmas, got laid off. He was pretty pissed off, but he also recognized it was entirely his own doing. He came and he pretty much said to me, if only I'd gone to those conferences, if only I had made sure I stayed up to date with the work I was doing. He had gone and happily just done what his managers had asked him to do, write up reports, work on his work, but he had not extended his learning in any way. He was being asked to write reports in a different style, with a different set of procedures, and he hadn't learned that ever. He hadn't really shown the initiative to do that. He hadn't gone and improved himself and stayed up to date. And he was pretty, like, totally admitted that it was entirely his fault. And he was five, ten years away from retiring and really probably wouldn't have found a job too easily in another pharmacy. Okay. So when you graduate, you can easily coast along probably for another 10, 15 years without any issue. What your knowledge that you'll have right now might be good enough to get you going but it's not going to get you going through your entire career. You're going to have to be able to figure out what it is that you don't know. And that's a tough thing. What don't you know? 
How can you learn it? Where can you learn it? Where can you find the information? That's self-directed learning. Okay. And we're going to provide you some tools to do that. For example, in some of the next tutorials, you're going to be answering questions that I've not taught you any material about. But you and your group are going to work together and you'll be quite successful actually at solving those problems without any knowledge that you've been taught explicitly. Okay? So figuring those things out. Staying up to date with the literature. So some of these books and, and magazines that come out, here's chemical engineering progress, here's a special issue of bioseparations, bioprocessing. Now, when I was in university, <coughs> we learned basic bioengineering, but nothing related to bioseparations and bioprocess control. There's a whole topic in here on genomic tools for producing biologics. I didn't learn anything about genomes, but you can be sure that it would be something that would be relevant to me because that's the way the world is moving. So staying up to date with these, with these topics. Never mind the occasional salary survey. It's good to know how you're being compensated relative to the rest of your peers. These are important pieces of information to stay on top of. So subscribing to these sorts of magazines and websites to stay up to date with your area really is important. Uh, we'll look at some of these other topics, what the PEO is about, engineering ethics. As I mentioned already in the past two tutorials, group work and time management is really critical. And we're going to build on your existing engineering science knowledge. So remember those core courses I showed you back there earlier in the slide, the engineering science courses? We're going to use those and build on them. That's why this course has so many prerequisites. Now, you will also learn a whole bunch of other software skills. So how do you deal with being a group chairperson and being an effective group member? We're going to have a whole tutorial and tutorials consistently emphasizing this issue. We're going to be looking at dysfunctional groups and functional groups. You might be unfortunate enough to be in a dysfunctional group, but we're going to give you tools and mechanisms to get out of that. We don't want anyone ending up in that situation at all. Um, communication. In the tutorials, you're going to have to communicate with each other within your group, but you're also going to have to communicate with the rest of the class. And you've got a good chance on Thursday and Friday to get to know um, a number of other people in the class, so now you're going to be fairly comfortable doing that. Um, brainstorming, reliable learning materials such as those magazines, websites, and so forth. Uh, technical writing skills, there will be a lot of writing in this course. Cover letters are essential and required for every assignment. So that will be, that will be something that's a little bit different from prior courses. Um, figuring out engineering data and economic data, where to find it and how to interpret that data. Managing your time. I probably don't have to speak to you about time management <coughs> over four years or more in your university system. And the fact you've made it to this class indicates that you've got a very good level of time management and uh, project management skills. But also bear in mind that you can improve on those. If you look at any company and they're running big projects, who runs those projects? What sort of skill sets do they have? You look at them in most cases, they're actually engineers running project management. And there's a reason for it. Because engineers have a good analytical model of constraints, prerequisites, post-requisites, managing their time. And it's intentional in the undergraduate course that you develop those skills. So they make great project managers. So you get a chance here to improve on those skills further. And then especially important in the last step here, Absolutely. I know already I'm going to get on the course evaluations. Questions were ambiguous, uncertain. I wasn't sure what he was asking. Okay? And that's intentional. Because no one in your life is the question ever very clear. So figuring out what, what is and what isn't asked and how to deal with that ambiguity is part of this course. Okay, so a little bit of unsolicited advice. It's the advice you didn't ask for, but you're getting it anyway. And that is to manage your time. About the lecture time here is about 25% of your time you're spending on 4N. So 75% of your time is outside of this class. In your groups, there is more work in those group projects than you can possibly do on your own. So if you've got the type of personality that wants to do everything all by yourself, one of the skills you will learn is to relinquish a bit of that. Okay? You will have to learn to work with other people and share that outside the class with others to 
achieve the final uh, project and hand it. I will also say that, though not necessarily on 4N, but you will likely have to work on the weekends. At least one of the days, either, either it is on 4N or other courses, but this is the time of the year for the next eight months where it's going to be a pretty intense finish to your end of your degree. If I think back in my own career, there were a few periods of time where life was pretty intense, but one of them was certainly my final year in undergraduate. Even though I wasn't here at Mac, uh, it's, the experience was very similar to the Mac Martin experience. It's going to be pretty, pretty busy. Okay, so you may have to figure out, sorry, you may have to refigure out how you reprioritize friends, families, and relationships with, with partners and significant others. Um, I do also recommend you take some time for yourself to clear your mind, and whether you do that <coughs> by running, with yoga, going to the gym, whatever that, whatever your preference is, uh, taking a walk to Mac and back home instead of taking a bus, there's 20 minutes of your day that you can fit in. However you achieve this, you do need some time to clear your mind and come to class fresh and at least have a chance to just decompress a little bit. Um, I do also recommend you get used to communicating how you are feeling with the colleagues in your group. It is going to be stressful and the most dysfunctional <coughs> groups are those where there's unspoken issues. If you're not communicating with each other and you're not telling the other person, look, I don't feel that your contribution is quite what we're looking for and explaining what your feelings are and why you're feeling it, then you're going to have some issues show up in the group. Okay? So it's going to be hard to do this initially. I will give you tools and mechanisms to make that a little easier. And we're going to build you up and not expect to do it out of, out of the gate. Okay? So, but please pay attention to that. Make sure you sleep at night. things are really not going well, then there's always myself and the team wants to come talk about it. Uh, we've not had, fortunately last year was actually pretty good, I think we made some changes to the course that led to some improvements, but there have been previous years where there's been several groups that have fallen apart sort of at, in December, late November, and that's too late to really do anything about. So the sooner you communicate issues, the sooner we can try and fix them up. Please make sure that you communicate those things with me earlier rather than later. Okay, let's talk a bit about grading. So because there's so much group work in this course, you'll see about 60% of your grade is due to group activities. There's a group submitted tutorials and assignments. There's group projects. There's these midterm tests at 12%. There's a final exam at 25%. And then there's some online questions and reflections. And some of these are grouped based on some individual. Okay, so there's a good chunk of the work here. I think it's about you know, whatever it is that's related to group activities. So that's much, much higher than in any other course. But as you also notice, it is spread out over several assessments. So there's no single big final exam or single big midterm that's going to pull you down here. But you do also please take pay attention to that 50% requirements. As I was saying in 4M this morning, there's no sense in you're doing well all the way to the end of the course and then just give up in the final exam. And it's especially tempting to do so in this course because the final exam is 25%. So some people will, will do well in all the group stuff and then commit the final exam I'll just kind of whatever I get, right? It's not, that's not an acceptable way to work. You wouldn't run a race to the end and you just give up right at the, at the finish line. So we, we expect the same sort of behavior in this course. The midterm is set for 8th, 8th of October, that's a Wednesday evening, and if I don't hear it otherwise by the end of today, it stays at 8th of, eight, sorry, 8th of October, I should say, not 8th of November. 8th of October, that Wednesday evening, um, is going to be fixed unless I hear otherwise by, by the end of today. Just make sure that it's, uh, I believe Wednesday is relatively free of conflict, so that should be a good time. Anyone wants to just quickly check, make sure? Looks fine. Okay, the final 
whole exam will be cumulative of everything, including the economics section. The midterm is restricted on the process economics part of the course. The final exam will be on everything, including economics. And with the midterm and the final exam, you can use any resources you like. So it's all the notes that you'd like to bring, any textbooks, any paper resources are more than welcome here. Exactly. Um, we can move to um, important topics. Yeah. Um, I think we have time for one more question. Yeah. 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 So tutorials. Tutorials are required and mandatory and you have to stay there for the full duration. This is the analogy. You do not show up at work and work on a group project and just choose to leave whenever you like and just leave your group to finish the work on your own. Okay. The tutorials are a group of five. Your, every tutorial will be in your group of five. So not showing up is contributing, is, not, is lack of contribution to your group. And it is mandatory, so the, your, the course outlines are planned or scheduled to be conflict-free for the most part, but if you're out of sync because of because you've failed prior courses and coming back in again, you may have conflicts, however, 4N does take priority. Uh, if you do have to be away for a job interview or so forth, that is something that you would arrange with your group. In no different to when you're working in a company and you ha maybe have to go to the dentist or drop your child off at daycare or some other conflict that comes up in your life, then you have to make that time up with your group in some way. And it might mean that you meet with your group after the fact or ahead of time to fit in that extra time. But that is the minimum requirement is that you do show up in the tutorial. And uh, we will be, we'll be checking that to make sure. And your group will automatically be checking that. I don't think any groups will allow you to systematically simply list the tutorial and they're doing all the work for you. Uh, so it's generally self-enforced. We have two tutorial slots Thursday and Friday, both from 11.30 to 1.30. Um, there will be some group presentations within those tutorials. The tutorial solutions are submitted by the next Wednesday in class with the cover page. And I expect at least one person in the tutorial group will have an internet-able device because you will be doing some research. There will be topics that you're having to look up during the tutorial that I've not taught in class. So generally, this is not an issue. Uh, statistically, 95 to 98 percent of you have some form of internet-enabled device. So that should be an issue. Any questions on the tutorial? Okay, so we've had our first tutorial already this past Thursday and Friday. The next one coming up Thursday and Friday, the 11th and 12th. Uh, the project now is obviously a major part of this course in terms of grades and the amount of work that you'll be doing. It's a self <coughs> learning project, and the tutorials will be supplementing that project. So the topics we cover in the tutorial feed into your project. And so when you're working on your tutorials, you should also be working on your project in parallel and adding what you've learned from that tutorial to your project. There's no reason why you'd be writing up your project report on the last few weeks from scratch. That project report is an ongoing piece of work. You'll be doing it in Google Docs, sharing it with your group, and in your groups of five, you'll be working on it consistently. So we'll be releasing that project in the next two, three weeks from now, so you can start to set all of that up in place and filling in the, the gaps so that by the end you really are just pulling together the final details of the project. So that more on that over the next few weeks in the class. So groups are groups of five and groups of five will simply magnify your strength. The effort that you can do within your groups of five is more than you can ever do individually obviously. Um, and you work in groups because this is an essential skill for later on in your career. For those of you that have done your co-ops or, or, or um, have a few more to go, but if you've worked in a prior co-op, you definitely have seen group work. No company ever has a single person running in the background working on stuff and stuff. It's almost always in a group of 
two or more people. There's a variety of viewpoints that come up from group work and that leads to conflict, but it also leads to what's often a better result than any one of these individual people would have contributed. So that, that combination of, of work is always better. Um, the only way that group work in this course is a little bit unrealistic is in most companies they would never put five chemical engineers together in a group. Right? There might be someone from business, someone from marketing, maybe a civil or mechanical engineer, as well as yourself as a chemical engineer, uh, and maybe from the plant operation side of things. So that's the only unrealistic case, and that's just what we're constrained to do in this course. But it's just, just to put that in perspective, that this is an essential skill that, that's required to be developed. Um, we will be selecting groups today. There's the website link is already active on the course website for you to start selecting your groups. What you will do is you have the opportunity to name three people you would like to work with. Now obviously there's going to be four other people in the group. So you're only naming three people who you'd like to work with. And all those three you name, you'll probably end up working with hopefully two of the people that you chose. Okay. So what the TAs and myself will do is we'll look at those group selections and we'll honor your selection for the most part where it's possible. But sometimes it's not possible. You might want to work with someone else, but they have they don't really indicate that they would like to work with you. And so that we, we want to avoid that where possible. Right? So if there's a mutual selection between people, we'll try to honor that. We also have to try and obviously match the people in the tutorial slot. So if you're scheduled for Thursday, the rest of the people that you ask to work with should ideally be in the Thursday tutorial. Otherwise, we cannot possibly form that group up for you. So make sure that the people you nominate are in the same tutorial slot as you, which is why we had that speed dating thing yesterday and today. We also um, don't want too many people of the same type within the group. So there have been occasions where People will select all engineering and management students, and you get five engineering and management <coughs> students in the group. And that's really um, not an effective group, either because they're all just the same way of thinking. So we'd like to mix that up a bit and prevent um, sort of homogeneous groups forming. We try to accommodate similar interests, and there's an element of randomness. At the end, if we really can't form the groups, there's a bit of a random number generator going on. Okay, so there's a lot of constraints and, and, and conflicts that prevent us from forming the group that you would like to be in. But by and large, uh, this process has worked really successfully and I've not had any major complaints about the group formation in the past. So please fill in those, those forms. Uh, we will be working in those groups for the remainder of the term. And there's really, there is no opportunity to change groups. Once we set the groups, that's the people we will work with. And again, no difference to working in a company. Your boss typically will form a group and that's who you work with on the project. So resolving those conflicts and getting over those speed bumps is something that's, that we all have to work in the future. But we try to make it a little bit easier. So there's the website that you can go fill in the form. Um, you'll tell me a bit about who you, who you are, uh, what your student number is, who you'd like to work with. You just have to at least get the last name of the person you want to work with spelled correctly. Not too much to ask, though. There have been times in the past where I'm like, I really don't know who you're asking to work with. So please make sure you get the spelling of their name correct so we can form, form that up. If you have till Sunday evening to do it, though, I would prefer you get it over and done with today, then that way we can start forming. <coughs> this does take a, uh, many hours to, to form, right? When we're trying to obey all these, these constraints. And there's a hundred of you in the class, so it's a little hard to do. Okay, so that's all I have for today's class. We're back on Monday, but before we close up, is there any questions or concerns? <coughs>